we come now to this fifth word that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uttered from the cross on Calvary's hill on that epic day. His fifth word is taken from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, and I'm going to read verses 28 and 29 for us. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. And immediately I began to think about how this speaks that even in death, the Lord Jesus Christ was aware of scriptural references that really did refer to his life from the Psalms, which we'll get to in a few moments. Continuing in verse 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked the sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Now, a hyssop plant leaf was not that long, and oftentimes we may have this depiction in our sanctified imaginations of the cross being very high. But I want to tell you that crucifixions happened very close to the ground. So for some of us, that may change what we are imagining right now as we work our way through these seven last words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is very near the ground, and those around the Roman soldiers, Mary, Mary Magdalene, a disciple or two perhaps, others that are walking by, those who were crucified under the Roman government were very close to the ground. Jesus had been without sleep from the time of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he was there with his disciples. He asked them to pray not once but twice, and they fell asleep. And he stated to them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We call that the eschatological tension. And there was Jesus to the point in his passion and his agony, praying to his heavenly father, seeking to obey him. And yet we begin to see his humanness, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God. He was able to fulfill his father's will. Why? Because at Christmas, as we celebrate his birth, we often say, Jesus is the reason for the season, and the ultimate reason why the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth was to die. And here we are in these moments, really closer to death now at this fifth word, I thirst, than the other words. He is literally dying and fulfilling his Father's will. And in the garden, we know that the word of God tells us that he was sweating like droplets of blood, beginning this agony even then. And he prayed, not my will, speaking of the fact that he is a human being and has the ability to make decisions, to obey or not to obey, not my will, but thy will be done. So he's been without food, without drink from the moment of his arrest there in the garden. He's suffering. Then he was taken before the Roman government. And I want you all to know something, that it wasn't the mob that took Jesus' life. It wasn't the soldiers. It wasn't um, Judas, the betrayer, who killed Jesus. It wasn't Annas, the high priest's um, father-in-law. It wasn't Caiaphas, the high priest, who sent him on to Pilate. It wasn't Pilate that took the Lord Jesus Christ's life. It wasn't him who drove him to the cross. Jesus surrendered his life. Jesus had no one take his life. He was walking in perfect obedience to his heavenly Father. He surrendered his life voluntarily for you and for me. So he's hanging on the cross in these moments as we consider this fifth word. He's in excruciating pain. His heart is pounding within his chest, trying to get oxygen to the rest of his body. And normally the manner of death under crucifixion was asphyxiation because one would push up with their legs for as long as they could because of dehydration and of course the word I thirst was a reality. He could only do that for so long. Anyone who was crucified would suffer so and he would allow himself to fall back down and hang from his arms and the lungs would be collapsed. It was a hypertensioning of the muscle structure in one's chest and it was agonizing, a horrible, horrible form of execution. But this word, I thirst, we are seeing Jesus Christ on display, his full humanity. He fully understands what it means to suffer as a human being. In these moments before us, he's presenting himself freely, a free offering, and he's literally dying and paying the penalty of our sins according to his Father's good pleasure. 
so that the scheming of the religious leaders, as I stated just a few moments ago, down through that, that uh, rendering of all the people that it were involved in his initial arrest, the trial, the two scourging, there was a light trial that was generally administered for light crimes and following Pilate's um, instructions to send him to crucifixion, the people crying out for Barabbas, he would have undergone a more severe flogging that was restricted to those who were convicted of more serious crimes as Jesus was. And he was flogged the second time and bore his cross to Calvary's heel. In John chapter 15, Jesus spoke these words, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then in chapter 14 and verse 31, this is very profound. The world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And why would, he, why would I read these scriptures? It's because sometimes we become very complex, especially those of you who are viewing this and you may be questioning, was Jesus Christ truly fully man and fully God? He truly was, and this is why he came to earth and humbled himself. In Psalm 22, we read these scriptures, which are messianic in nature, portions thereof. Psalm 22, starting with verse 14. And these are the words I believe that John was referring to when he talked about so that the scriptures would be fulfilled from verse 28 in chapter 19 of the Gospel of John. David wrote, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a podsherd, which is a dry piece of pottery. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, which Jesus surely would have been experiencing. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me, imagine. And then from Psalm 69, these two verses, verse 3 and verse 21. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. The Apostle Paul wrote scriptures to, in his letter to the Philippians. And this whole matter of Jesus being fully man and fully God fulfilling the obedience of his heavenly father to the T. Paul wrote these words. First in Colossians, he wrote this, for in him, Jesus, the whole fullness, the completeness lacking in nothing of deity dwells bodily. So Paul was affirming to the Christians at Colossae and he's affirming for us today through the word inspired written to us that Jesus was fully God. And then this very, very classic and well-known portion of scripture from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter two, beginning with the fifth verse. Have this in mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, which speaks of the relational aspect of what Father God desires for each and every one of us, for me and for you this day as we consider the cross of Calvary. And this fifth word, how Jesus was thirsting, yes, for a drink, but also he longed to obey his heavenly Father. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Hebrews, in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted because he was a human being. He was tempted in every way, and yet he was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Charles Spurgeon writes this about this fifth word. Our senior pastor, the Reverend Craig Geergo, is, is very, very much ado about Charles Spurgeon, a very, very famous preacher, and I admire him as well. He said this, 
While thus we admire our Lord's condescension, let us, our thoughts, also turn with delight to his sure sympathy. For if Jesus said, I thirst, then he knows all our frailties and woes. The next time we are in pain or are suffering depression of spirit, we will remember that our Lord understands it all, for he has had practical, personal experience of it. Neither in torture of body nor in sadness of heart are we deserted by our Lord. The path upon which he walked is parallel with ours. That is so true today. So Jesus, the sinless, sinless Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he is hanging on Calvary's cross. He's taking our place. Theologically, it's called penal substitutionary atonement. He is paying the penalty for our sins, separation from his heavenly Father, which he will experience. He's making that, that sacrifice that Father God requires, the shedding of his blood, and then the penal substitutionary atonement that he provides, that atonement is a covering. It's an impartation of righteousness, which is a free gift to all who would begin to put their faith and trust and reliance upon him. And literally the sacrifice that we today are contemplating together, the shedding of his blood on Calvary's hill, according to his father's good pleasure and perfect will for you and for me. Let's pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, who even though you wonderfully fashioned all things, stooped to take upon yourself human form, and being found in human form endured the cross, despising its shame. We love you for every parched and painful moment spent on our behalf, that we might drink of the water of life freely and live. Even as your strength was dried up like a potsherd, and your tongue cleaved to the jaws of your mouth, it was that springs of living water might well up within us unto eternal life. With grateful hearts, we praise you this day. Amen.